Man, we're pumped about what's about to happen right now. Folks, this is the deal. You're about to be challenged. And I love this because I love this. And this is just kind of black and white. And when God says something that he did, he meant that's what he did. Disregard. There are times that you have to disregard what somebody might tell you. There are times you're going to have to disregard what the smartest people on the planet might tell you. When you honestly come to a place to believe this. This is for those who are, can have an ear that could listen at any age. At any age this morning. Because this lie has been a lie that's been around a long time, and it's truly a lie that has really come directly from the enemy, from Satan. And I'm going to have Chris Miller come up. My friend, if you could come up, please. And uh, he is, he is going to speak this out. This is our Timeless series. And I tell you what, I have heard Chris many times. How many talks have you given now? Um, Over six. Last time it was 600, and he's been gone oh, oh, for the last... Almost like, 700. Almost 700 talks. Just for the last, I don't know, four or five weeks, he's been gone every Sunday talking on creation versus evolution. And if, we ha if we're going to have a series called Timeless, one of the absolute timeless truths is the very first sentence of the absolute scriptures that in the beginning God created. And that is a timeless truth regardless of who says what, regardless of the smartest people on the planet. And I tell you what, Chris has been doing some things. He's given his talks here. Uh, every talk that he has, he's given in regards to all of, all of where he understands creation and evolution and science and just just brilliant just brilliant and you're going to hear some passion from him this morning in regards to once when someone lied to him folks you get upset when someone lies to you or someone lied to him and he believed the lie and it caused him to discredit god wow and when you understand that this is an absolute plot from the enemy to get people lied to because he's a liar he is a deceiver and to attack God to get the church to question what God said I'm telling you this this morning you're going to be challenged and this is a timeless truth that God is still the creator oh God you're going to have to make a decision whether you believe that or not now, Chris Miller is just phenomenal phenomenal and we are blessed to have him and his wife and their, their children in this church as a part of Believer's Chapel and his family for many years. And uh, he brings so much to the table. Um, and this is one of the huge issues he brings to this church. It's awesome. Chris Miller, I love you. Man. Come on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. <clears throat> I just love speaking on creation versus evolution. <laughs> uh, but... First, before I get, really get started, I, I want to make sure everyone knows where I stand on this issue. I, I think that's only fair. So I want to tell you that I believe in creation. I give God full credit for his creation just the way he said he did it. However, there was a time when I believed in evolution. I was a very strong believer in evolution. In fact, I can tell you with certainty that there is no one on earth today who believes in evolution more strongly than I did. And the reason I can say that is because I was 100% convinced. I had absolutely no doubts whatsoever about the truth of evolution. But today, well, I should say back then, when people said they did not believe in evolution, I thought they were wrong. So I would try to correct them. I tried to persuade people to believe in evolution. I can remember poking fun at my wife Sandy because she believed in creation. But today, I believe in creation. And so, as you can see, I've been on both sides of this issue in a big way. Now, I titled this particular talk, The Word of God versus The Word of Man. And the reason I chose this title is because we get creation from the Word of God, and we get evolution from the Word of Man. I mean, when you think about it, there is not one mention of evolution in the Word of God, which means that everything we hear about evolution, everything must come from the Word of Man, because it doesn't come from the Word of God. So when you're talking about creation versus evolution, what you're really talking about is the Word of God versus the Word of man. Now, there's a Gallup poll out there they, they, on creation versus evolution, and they've been taking this same poll for decades. They take it every, every two or three years, and they, and they always ask the same 
questions, give you the same choices to, to pick from. And the most recent one that they gave was 2014. I want to show you the results from that poll. As always, they let you choose from three things. They say, do you believe in creation the way God said he did it? 42% of the people said that's what they believe. Another choice you could pick was, no, do you believe that God used evolution instead to gradually create life over millions of years? 31% of the people said that's what they believe. And the third choice you could pick was, do you believe in evolution without God at all? Purely atheistic evolution. And 19% of the people said that that's what they believe. That was in 2014. Now, as recently as 1999, that bottom figure was only 9%. So it's doubled since then. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's what we teach our children in school. 19 this is what is taught to our children in school, the belief system of just 19% of the population. If you, people tend to believe what they're taught. That's right. We teach our children atheistic evolution in school, so more and more of them grow up believing in atheistic evolution. That's the way it works. People tend to believe what they're taught. That's the way it always is. That's the way it is in other places. You know, sometimes we look at some of these countries on the other side of the world and we think, Wow, they got some strange beliefs over there. How do the adults believe those types of things? Well, just look what they're taught when they're young. That's right. People tend to believe what they're taught. Now, if you look at this poll a little deeper, this 2014 poll, and I would encourage you to do so, you can find it very easily with Google, you will see that they ask follow-up questions to find out other things. For instance, they wanted to find out how the people who go to church believe on evolution. And it turns out the people who said they attend church faithfully every week, a full 25% of them said, I believe in evolution. And of the people who said they attend church nearly every weekly, nearly every week, or, or at least monthly, 48% of them said, I believe in evolution. Now, if you look at these numbers as a whole, it becomes very obvious that at least one out of three people in churches this morning believe in evolution. This is Sunday morning. There are millions of people in church all across this country. And if asked, one out of three of them would say, I believe in evolution. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Huh. Well, what's wrong with it is that evolution contradicts the Word of God. And if two things contradict each other, they cannot both be true. For instance, if I say today is Wednesday and you say it's Sunday, those two statements contradict each other. It cannot be both Sunday and Wednesday here at the same time. Well, it's the same way with evolution and the Word of God. They contradict each other. They cannot both be true. Only one of them can be true. Now, I'm going to show you some ways that evolution contradicts the Word of God. But first, I want to make sure everyone has a full understanding of what evolution is. Now, I know everybody knows that evolution says that some ape-like creatures eventually changed into people. But there's more to it than that, and I want to... And, 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 I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Evolution is a man-made theory, entirely invented by man. Primarily this man, Charles Darwin. He was the father of evolution. And Darwin wrote this book called Origin of Species. He published it in 1859. And it was with this book that Darwin first presented his theory of evolution to the world. So let's see in Darwin's own words what evolution is. Therefore, I should infer from analogy that probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form. So according to Darwin, evolution says that all life on earth, past life, present life, plant life, animal life, all life, anything that lives or has ever lived on the earth, everything has descended from a single microbe that lived long ago. So the way they teach evolution in school is this. They say at one time there was no life on earth, but there were chemicals. And at some point in time, those chemicals got together just right to form the first life. That is called spontaneous generation. And every evolution scientist in the world believes that spontaneous generation happened in the past, from life, from non-life to life. And then that first life evolved into sea creatures, 
which then evolved into fish, and then bigger fish, and then amphibians, and then reptiles, and then mammals, and then bigger mammals, and eventually people. And along the way, they branched out into different things. So the, all life, anything that's ever lived on the earth or lives on the earth, everything is connected in this big web of life. And everything is related to everything else one way or another. We're all one big happy family here on earth. So at home, I have a family photo album. And in that album, I have pictures of some of my relatives who lived in the past. But let's just pretend something. Let's just pretend two things. First of all, let's pretend evolution is true. And secondly, let's pretend that somehow I had pictures of all my relatives who ever lived. Now, if that was the case, it would take a huge library to fill all those albums. But if that was the case, I could walk into that library and start looking through those albums, and I'd find pictures of some relatives of mine that were, looked pretty interesting. <laughs> For instance, I could find pictures of some ape-like creatures that were relatives of mine. I might even call one of them Uncle Ape. <laughs> now, wh why are you laughing at my relative? <laughs> After all, he is your relative, too, if evolution is true, which, by the way, is believed by one out of three people in churches this morning. How about Aunt Liz? <laughs> I also believed. How about Grandma Fish? Actually, if evolution is true, then each one of you had millions of sets of grandparents who were fish. And that's because evolution says that it took fish millions of years and millions of generations to finally develop legs so they could crawl out of the ocean and give rise to your next grandparents. How about some of my relatives who are, who are still alive today, some of my distant relatives? Last year, we had kind of a, like a family get-together and a re type of reunion, and, and Sandy took a picture of me and one of my cousins together. <laughs> Cousin Oak. <laughs> now, you might think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. This is exactly what they teach our children in public schools. Oh, well, they're a little more clever about how they present it, but if your child pays attention, this is exactly what they'll come out of school with, that they are related to trees. And just to emphasize this a little more, I want to show you a quote from a very famous evolution scientist who's saying just that. Carl Sagan, one of the most famous evolution scientists who ever lived. He was once voted the smartest man in America by the readers of Parade Magazine, uh, for whatever that's worth. But, but Carl Sagan was a very intelligent, very influential, highly published evolution scientist. And he hosted the original Cosmos series. Now, some of you may have seen some of the remake of the Cosmos series that started playing a, a year, year and a half ago. But the original Cosmos series was hosted by Carl Sagan. And it was shown in over 60 countries worldwide and viewed by an estimated 500 million people. So again, Carl Sagan was a very popular, very intelligent, highly respected evolution scientist. And he wrote this book called Cosmos to go along with the series Cosmos. I want to show you something he wrote on page, beginning on page 33 of this book. An oak tree and I are made of the same stuff. If you go far enough back, we have a common ancestor. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have common ancestors with oak trees, then that makes oak trees your distant cousins. So here I am hanging out with my cuz. <laughs> Okay, so that's what evolution is, which I like to call the word of man because 100% evolution comes from the word of man. Okay, now how about creation, which comes from the word of God? Well, fortunately, creation is pretty easy to explain because God makes it abundantly clear in his word just what creation is. In Exodus chapter 20, as written down by Moses, we are told the following. For in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So what did God make in the six creation days? Everything. He made the heavens and everything in the heavens. You know, the sun, the moon, the stars. He made everything in the heavens, everything in the earth, and everything in the sea in six days. What could be more clear than that? 
you know, there are some parts of Scripture that are a little harder to get your head around. You might think, well, just exactly what's God trying to tell us here? There's some parts like that. But this is not one of those parts. <laughs> this is as simple and clear, straightforward as you can get. God created everything in six days. And to make it even more clear, he talks about the six days on the very first page of his word. Front dead center. Genesis 1, the first page of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. He puts the six days of creation. In fact, let's do that. Let's go to Genesis 1. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I would encourage you to later, if you've not read it recently. Maybe you can read it tonight. There's nothing good on TV tonight. <laughs> but when you read the first chapter of Genesis, you will see that God specifically defines the first day of Genesis as having, or I'm sorry, the first day of creation as having just one evening and one morning. And you will find they specifically define the second day as having just one evening and one morning. Day three, four, five, and six. Each of the six creation days, God specifically defines each one individually as having just one evening and one morning each. Do you think God was trying to make a point? I think he was. I think he was trying to tell us that when he says he created everything in six days, what he really meant was that he created everything in six days. Six evenings and six mornings. What could be more clear than that? And just to make it even more clear, he tells us what he created in each of the six days. For example, day six, he says that's the day he created man and the land animals. Another example would be day three. He says that's the day he created trees and other vegetation. Another example would be day five. He says that's the day he created birds and all the sea creatures. So as you can see, creation has a definite order to it on how life showed up on Earth. But remember, evolution had an order to it also. One thing evolved into another, then into another, then into another. So as it turns out, both creation and evolution have life appearing on the Earth in a very specific order. However, <laughs> and this is a huge however, however, the order of creation and the order of evolution are very different from each other. In other words, they contradict each other. And when two things contradict each other, they cannot both be true. Just like it can't be Sunday and Wednesday here at the same time. Same thing with evolution and God's word. They cannot both be true. Now let me show you some ways that evolution contradicts the word of God. According to evolution, animals roamed the earth for millions of years until finally the first bird evolved into existence. So animals first and then birds. But that's not what God says. Oh, no, 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 no. No, God says just the opposite. God says he created birds for any land animals. Remember Genesis 1? He says he created the birds on day 5, but he didn't create the land animals until the next day. Just the opposite of evolution. No evolution scientist in the world would say there were birds on the earth before there were land animals. But God says there were. And, and God should know because he's the one that put them both here. Another example. Evolution says that there were creatures in the sea for three billion years before the first tree ever evolved into existence. But that's not what God says. Oh no, God says just the opposite. God says he created trees before any of the sea creatures. Remember Genesis 1? He says he created all the sea creatures in day five, but he says he created trees two days earlier. Just the opposite of what evolution says. No evolution scientist in the world would say there were trees on the earth before there were sea creatures. <laughs> but God says there were. Right on the first page of his word, front dead center. And yet, one of all three people in churches this morning believe in evolution when it contradicts the first page of God's word. You know, I thought we'd go to church to study the word of God. How do you study a book we don't even believe the first page of it. I mean, think about this. You, let's say you go to a library and, and you want to take out a book to read and you want a true story. You want a documentary. So you pull a book off the shelf and say, well, maybe this one. And you open up to the first page and you see what you believe are glaring mistakes all over the first page. Are you going to take that book out? That book would be a joke to you. 
If you can't believe the first page of a book, how do you know what other parts you could believe? Evolution makes a mockery of the first page of the Word of God. And yet, one out of three people in churches this morning say they believe in evolution, which makes a mockery of the first page of the Word of God. You know, it makes you wonder if some people in churches this morning do not realize that evolution contradicts Scripture. Well, they should realize it. It's talked about all the time. <laughs> it's written about all the time. Even evolution scientists, who usually know squat about the Bible, even they know evolution contradicts Scripture. Let me show you some examples. Let me show you some examples where evolution scientists make it very clear that they know evolution contradicts Scripture. First example, Encyclopedia Britannica, most prestigious encyclopedia in the world. Now I know that most of you do not read the encyclopedia because you've got the internet. <laughs> but let me tell you a little secret about the internet. Not everything you read on the internet is true, <laughs> really. But everything you read in Britannica is supposed to be true, and that's because the science articles in Britannica were written by some of the smartest people in the world, and then they, were, then they were reviewed by other smart people, and by the time they get vetted out and make it in Britannica, you're supposed to be able to bank on them. I like to call Britannica the gospel according to man. Now, this is a picture I took of our set at home. Actually, there's a lot more volumes than that, but I want to draw your attention to this volume right here, volume 7. In volume 7 of our Britannica at home, there's an article on evolution, and in that article, they make it very clear that evolution contradicts Scripture. Let me show you. Darwin did two things. He showed that evolution was a fact contradicting scriptural legends of creation and that its cause, natural selection, was automatic with no room for divine guidance or design. Now, I disagree that evolution is a fact, but I do agree that evolution contradicts Scripture. It most certainly does. Let me show you another example. Edward Wilson, another, another very famous evolution scientist. He was a research, he's still alive. He's a research, he was a research scientist at Harvard University for many years. And he wrote, wrote a lot of books. He won not one, but two Pulitzer Prizes. Let me show you what he said. As were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17, I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution. Now I can't speak for whether or not Dr. Wilson was really born again, but he says he was, until he heard about evolution. Then he saw the contradiction, and he knew he had to either throw out the Word of God or throw out the Word of man. <laughs> Unfortunately, he threw out the Word of God, but at least he realized he couldn't believe both because they contradict each other. Another example, Charles Darwin. I don't know if you realize it or not, but at one time, Charles Darwin was studying to be a minister. Oh yeah, yeah, Darwin, at one time he was taking theology courses at Cambridge University. At one time, the plan for Charles Darwin's life was to become a preacher of the Word of God. Well, that all changed when he invented evolution and believed evolution because then he saw the contradiction. Let me show you, let me show you what he said after he became a believer in evolution. And this is a one sentence from him, and it's a, it's a letter. It's a one sentence letter he wrote uh, just a couple years before he died. A one sentence letter he wrote in direct response to a, que a direct question he got. And by the way, this, this letter, the original letter, sold just this past September in New York City at an auction, the original letter, for $197,000. $197,000 for one sentence. Here's the sentence. I'm sorry to have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And that's coming from someone who at one time was studying to be a preacher of the Word of God. Another example, William Provine, another well-known evolution scientist. He was a professor at Cornell University for many years where he taught evolutionary biology to thousands of students. Let me show you what he said. 
let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain I'm going to be dead. That's the end of me. Now, how would you like to have had Dr. Provine teach your child biology in, in school? Well, he taught it to thousands of other people's children, and there are many William Provines throughout the schools in this country. And let me tell you something else about William Provine. One time, he took a poll of his students at the very beginning of the semester. And from that poll, he found out that 75% of his students gave God some credit. They either believed in creation outright, or they believed that God used evolution. But at least 75% of them gave God some credit. Then he took the same poll of the same students after teaching them one semester of biology. And this time, only 50% of them gave God some credit. So it went from 75% to 50% after just one semester of evolution. And William Provine was quite proud of that. Richard Dawkins, far and away the most famous, famous atheist alive today, championing the humanist, once voted the humanist of the year, professor at Oxford University, has written many books, including some bestsellers. People just gobble up his atheistic literature. Now let me show you something he said that relates to what I'm talking about here. Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Now what does Dawkins mean, an intellectually fulfilled atheist? We see, before Darwin invented evolution, it was hard to be an atheist because atheists at that time had no way to explain how we got here. I mean, we're here, and if God did not create us, how did we get here? So it was hard to be an atheist back then. But, along, but then along came Darwin with his invention of evolution. And the atheists immediately jumped on that and said, aha, that's how we got here, by evolution. We, no God needed. We went from the slime to people just by evolution. So that's what Dawkins means when he says Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. So when it comes to creation and evolution, should we believe the word of God or should we believe the word of man? Let me show you something Jesus said that I think can be applied here. John chapter 5. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Now, if you read the context of this, you'll see what was going on here is that Jesus was admonishing the Pharisees and perhaps others for not believing his teachings about himself. And the approach Jesus used here was to say, hey, if you believe what Moses wrote, you believe what I'm telling you. But since you don't even believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I tell you? So Jesus makes it very clear here that we should believe what Moses wrote. And you know, the Bible tells us three places. Jesus is the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And ladies and gentlemen, if the King of kings and Lord of lords tells us that we should believe what Moses wrote, then we should believe what Moses wrote. And what did Moses write? Well, among other things, he wrote that God created everything in just six days. How do we dare not believe that? God is our Father. And we should be proud of our Father. He's done some marvelous things. He's had some huge accomplishments, and we should give him credit for those accomplishments. I'm a father. I'm a father to three children. And I've had some accomplishments that I'm proud of. For example, when Sandy and I first got married, we bought a house together. It was a nice house, but the basement was not finished. And I had a lot of time then because we didn't have any children yet. So I said to Sandy, you know what? I'm going to finish our basement off. And I'm going to finish it all by myself. That's going to be my thing. So when I get done, I can say I pounded every nail. So for the next four months, I worked like a trooper in that basement. I worked in the mornings before I went to work. I worked in the evenings when I got home. I worked on weekends. My days off, every chance I got, I worked in that basement. And after just four months, I had it done. And I could say I did it all by myself. I did the wiring myself, the plumbing, the sheetrock, the wainscot, the molding, the ceiling. I even put down the carpet by myself. And I was quite proud of that. Oh, and, and years later, when we eventually sold that house, 
The man who bought the house said to me, you know, Chris, what really sold me in your house was the basement. <laughs> so I had a right to be proud of that accomplishment. Now, it wasn't many months after that that we started having our children. And we had, we had three boys. We had them close together, 14 months apart and 15 months apart. So they were so close in age, they became little playmates with each other. And they became playmates with the neighbor kids down the street. And sometimes they'd get together. Our boys would get together with their, with their little friends from the neighborhood, and they'd have their little conversations together. What is cuter than that than to hear little kids having their conversations? And I'd listen to them sometimes. But what really warmed my heart was sometimes I'd overhear our boys in those conversations with the other kids. I would overhear our boys bragging on their daddy. Well, our daddy, he can do this, or, or our daddy did that. Boy, does that not warm a man's heart. But let's just pretend for a minute. Now, this next part didn't happen, but let's just pretend for a minute that instead of overhearing our boys brag on their daddy, instead I overheard them tell their little friend something like this. <clears throat> well, our... Our, our daddy, he, he says he finished our basement in just four months, all by himself. But we don't believe him. We don't believe daddy. And the reason we don't believe daddy is because Joey, you know Joey lives down the street? Joey said that, Joey's pretty smart. And Joey said there's no way that your daddy could have finished that basement all by himself in four months because Joey says, because it would have taken your daddy many years to have finished that basement. And he could not have done it the way he said he did it. He must have been something else going on, some help with some other process or something. But there's no way he could have finished it in four months, and there's no way he could have done it the way he said he did it. Now, if I'd overheard our boys tell their friends that, that would have crushed me. That would have really upset me and even would have made me angry. You know why? You know why that would upset me so much? Because those were my children. And I had given them my word that I'd finish that basement by myself in just four months. And to overhear them doubting my word like that and teaching others to doubt my word would have just really upset me and made me angry. I don't care what Joey says or how smart Joey is. I'm their daddy, and I'm smarter than Joey anyway. They should believe daddy instead of Joey. Now, God is our father, and we are his children. And if it would upset me that much to overhear my children doubt my word and teach others to doubt my word, what do you suppose it does to God when he overhears us doubting his word and teaching others to doubt his word? I think it upsets him and makes him angry. Why do so many Christians refuse to accept God's version of creation when it's just so clear? Well, <laughs> this is an easy question to answer. <laughs> it's because they think that scientists have somehow proven evolution to be true. Take that away, nobody be saying this. I mean, think about it. If next month, all the bright scientists of the world came out against evolution, the headlines of the papers are, scientists of the world give up on evolution. They found new evidence and said, there's no way evolution can be true. Darwin was full of baloney. <laughs> but don't worry, we have another theory we're working on that we want you to I believe in. Now, if that was the case, would one out of three people in churches this morning still say, I believe in evolution? Would they say, I don't care what all the bright scientists of the world say, I believe God used evolution to create life. Of course not. The only reason they say it now is because they think evolution has been proven. You take that away, nobody would say that. Well, two things on that. First of all, <laughs> Evolution has not been proven. No one's ever proven evolution. That's why it's a theory. Secondly, if you've heard any of my talks on biology or geology or paleontology, then you know that once you hear both sides of the issue, the evidence overwhelmingly favors creation over evolution. And yet people think evolution has been proven. Why do they think that? Also an easy question to answer. It's because that is what they have been taught. 
and people tend to believe what they're taught. Let me show you. Let me show you some examples where people are taught that evolution is a fact. Here's a uh, biology book that I bought at a, at a bookstore on campus. Actually, a campus not far from here. <laughs> and I'm pretty much guaranteed that some people in this room go to that campus to school. But anyway, when I bought this book, it's quite a few years ago, but when I bought this book, it was being used to teach an introductory course of biology at that campus. Let me show you what the students were taught from this book. Virtually all biologists consider evolution to be a fact. Why? Because an overwhelming body of evidence permits no other conclusion. And here's a book that I had to use for a paleontology course I took at Penn State. Let me show you what I was taught from this book. <clears throat> there is no longer any controversy as to whether or not evolution has taken place. The huge and growing mass of data demonstrate decisively the fact of evolution. That's what I was taught, so that's what I believe. And it wasn't just that quote. The whole book, the whole course, everything was taught as if evolution was a fact. And so I got out of school, and I believed that. And for years, for years after that, I kept going to church, Sunday mornings, all the while believing evolution to be true. I was part of that one out of three people in churches this morning because of what I had been taught. Let me show you a real fact about evolution. It is a fact that most, not all, but most of the smartest people in the world believe in evolution. And people like to believe like the smart people do because it makes them feel smart. I have a term for this I made up. I call it the smart club. <laughs> now, you probably know some people in the smart club. They're the people that go around acting smart all the time. And how do they do that? They go around quoting people on evolution. And they go around quoting people on the Big Bang. They go around quoting pe smart people on everything. They love to quote smart people because it makes them feel smart. Now, I want you to think about the people you know in the smart club. Has any one of them ever proven evolution to be true? Of course not. No one's ever done that. You know what that means? That means that the people you know in the smart club, all they're really doing is going around quoting the beliefs of other smart people. I have to confess, I used to belong to the smart club, but I got kicked out. <laughs> and the reason I got kicked out of the smart club is because I quit believing in evolution. You cannot belong to man's smart club if you don't believe what the smartest people believe. And most of the smartest people believe that in evolution. So I got kicked out. But that's okay. That's all right. I don't mind anymore because you know why? Because now instead of going around quoting smart people all the time, I go around quoting God. And that's worked out a lot better because, you see, God knows some things that smart people don't know because God has been an eyewitness to things that they have never seen. As a matter of fact, God has been an eyewitness to everything that has ever happened. And God has been an eyewitness to everything that will happen. Amen. So it doesn't make a lot more sense to go around quoting God who knows everything instead of going around quoting smart people who, compared to God, know almost nothing. Of course it does. Besides, what does God think about man's smart club? He thinks it's foolishness. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Anytime smart people say something that contradicts God's word, it's foolishness. So as it turns out, everybody has a choice to make when it comes to creation and evolution. You can trust the word of God and look foolish to man or... You can trust the word of man and look foolish to God. That's our choice. We either have to look foolish to man or look foolish to God, one or the other. Now, one more thing I want to mention, then I'll stop. There will come a day for each one of us when we have to stand alone before our Creator and give an account. Now, when that day comes, and it's really come for each one of us, when that day comes, how would you like to be part of that one all three in churches this morning who do not believe God's version of creation? 
And what would you say? Now, I've thought about this. And first of all, we really won't be standing in front of the Creator, will we? We'll be on our knees. Guarantee it. It doesn't matter who we are or what position we have in life. The Bible says that every knee shall bow. So think about this. You're on your knees in front of your Creator, giving an account, and you're part of that one all three Christians. What would you say? Well, I've thought about this, and I know what you'd have to say. First of all, you have to tell the truth because God already knows the truth, so lying would not really apply here. So what is the truth? Well, I've thought this through, and here's what the truth is. Well, God, the reason I did not believe that you created everything in the way you said you did it is because some really smart people said it couldn't have been done that way. Whoa. In other words, you'd have to admit to God that you believe what Professor Joey taught you instead of what Daddy said. Wouldn't you rather be in the position on that day to know that you had believed the Word of God and that you had believed what Moses wrote? That's where I want to be. Okay, let me just close in prayer. Please bow your heads. Father God, <laughs> thank you so much for your word. Word of an all-knowing God. The word of a loving father to his beloved children. The word of an eyewitness account. Father, please help us to stand up to the wisdom of this world, which so often goes against your word. And again, Father, thank you for your truth. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, amen. Give him thanks. Would you please? Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you what, I would be kind of really bummed if one out of three people that attend this church believed the Bible's true. I'd be bummed by that. And when you walk out of this place and say, I don't believe in creation, then you're really believing that the Word of God is not true. And we stand strong that the Word is true. That's our foundation, man. That's how firm we are. Always have been. Never going to change. Man, so I'm asking you to really make a decision after what you've just heard. It's just simple. Chris does a phenomenal job with his passion and desire because he really, he, he was one who was lied to and bought into a lie. And again, this is a ploy from the enemy, folks. It's not, it's not you know, Hawkins or Dawkins or Darwin. It sounds like a law firm, but it's, it's, not, it's not them. <laughs> that was good, but that just... <laughs> but it's not, I mean, that's just man. They're just men. Buried, by the way. It's most of them. It's really what God says. And the enemy, guess who the enemy uses? The enemy uses man. He uses people. He uses mankind to get his lies across. I mean, we should be bummed that if we actually bought into one of his lies, it actually changed our opinion on God. Completely based on a lie from the enemy. Gang, this is a serious battle for church today. That's why it had to be in this series. It's a timeless truth that is a serious battle in church today. On the grounds of the Bible's absolute truth. That one out of three people in church this morning, and I hope not Believer's Chapel, I really do, but in church around America today, believe in evolution. When God so amazingly puts it so extremely clear to you and I. As a, and I love Chris's parallel from a father's point of view. Why would my children discredit what I've done? It's an amazing parable. Why would my children discredit what I've done? Psalms 8 says that it is His majesty and His splendor that's on display. God's majesty, His excellence, His power, His radiance, His authority, His dominion. He says, I've put it on display. What if we say, well, I don't really believe that. Gang, you're undermining the name of God.
in regards to his majesty, his excellence, his authority, his power, and his strength, that he says, I put it on display for you to know who I am. Wow. So, man, honestly, where are you in this this morning? And I'm hoping that you have really made a decision. No matter what I will ever be taught, no matter whoever says anything, no matter how smart they are, no matter what public opinion is, no matter if I have to stand alone, if I'm the only one, whether it's a classroom, whether I'm the only one, whether honestly it's a teacher, whether I'm the only one, whether it's as an adult, I'm the only one, I'm going to believe this. Because my Father is the creator of the universe. And no one's going to lie to me about it where I'm going to believe it. That's the bottom line today. Folks, as we sing and as we connect to God, I'm asking that you walk out of here in confidence that God is still and always has been and always will be the creator of the heavens and the earth. And before we sing, I just want you to look at me for one, one second here. Because next week, next Sunday, is the close to this series. It has been a phenomenal series. And I had, I was ready to close it in one specific way. I had the whole series mapped out. And then last Tuesday night, God started to work on my heart. And then Wednesday morning, just in my time of prayer and my reading, my studying, things just changed. I believe next Sunday, people are going to be set free in this place. Because the message is this, sin is still sin. That's a timeless truth. But God's grace abounds. When you understand that God is not holding sin over your head, so why do we? Why do we hold sin over our heads? Why is it that we're the ones who hold on to sin? When God sees us through the cross, and He sees us as white as snow, He sees a white sheet on the other side of that cross, and that's me and you. But we're the ones who hold sin over our own head. We're the one who allows sin to be a handcuff or a chain that bounds us. When God is not the one holding sin, when you get into the depth of grace, and we're talking about the depth of grace next weekend, and you go deep into that, and you're just amazed by that, it will cause you to get on your face. It will cause you to understand what worship really is because of God's grace, His unmerited, undeserved favor and kindness for me. For it was His kindness that led me to repentance. And when you understand that, People will be set free from holding sin over our own heads when the creator of the universe does not. And how he sees us through a blood-stained cross. Please don't miss next Sunday. You're not going to want to miss this. In fact, I'm asking you to invite people. I'm asking you to invite somebody you know that's hurting and broken. You know somebody who is dealing with something in the past. And they need to be free. And it's God's grace. It's His grace. It is that kindness that is undeserved. That God, when you begin to see how God sees you, next week I pray that it changes how you see you. I'm praying that it changes how you see you. It's when you see how God sees you. So that's next Sunday. Don't miss us. Folks, we're going to stand. We're going to close in a song. Come on.